Welcome everyone to today's program. I am Emily Rapley with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have and will follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. There you can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. In the handout section of your control panel, you'll find a white paper that correlates with today's presentation. Please feel free to download this white paper. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Allison Gilmore is currently a data scientist on the team at IASB, where she specializes in highly complex and dimensional data across a variety of industries. Prior to joining IASB, Allison served as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow and an assistant adjunct professor in mathematics at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Gilmore also did postdoctoral research at Princeton University. She received her PhD in mathematics from Columbia University in New York in May 2011. Her research interests include topology, geometry, network analysis, and social movements. Dr. Gilmore serves on the board of the Friends of the Mandela Road Foundation, whose mission is to fund the development of exceptional leadership capacity in Southern Africa. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Gilmore to begin today's presentation. Thanks very much for that introduction. And I'm looking forward to talking with everyone today about the challenges of denials management. So as we all know, denials are a substantial and persistent problem that every provider faces. Some reports put the losses for providers at 3 to 5% of net revenue annually. Others put it even up into the double digits. For most providers, that's tens of millions of dollars a year at least. It's a substantial problem despite many decades of work on this problem and uh, better tools and processes that have come with all of that work. There are best practices for revenue cycle management, there are lean processes, there are new analytic methods and best practices there, and nonetheless, this denials management problem persists. You already know who your top payers are that are driving denials. You already know whether pre-certification denials or medical necessity denials are a bigger problem. You already know which are the most problematic facilities in your network. Um, the best practices in all of the work to date has gotten you through the low-hanging fruit. The reason this problem has been so persistent is that there's not much for low-hanging fruit left. What's left is complex and it's not obvious. So the underlying challenge with the denials problem is the complexity of the data. You think about a UB04 claim form that has 80 form locators on it. That's at least 80 things that you know about every single claim you submit. And in fact, you know more than that. Right? You know what happens to that claim after submission. You know things about the account that's related to that claim and about that patient's history. And as ICD-10 comes into play, you're going to know even more at an even more granular level. There's at least 100 features there associated with every claim. That's a lot of data, and it's very complex, intensely multivariate data. Denials are not related to any single one of those features that you know about each of those claims. They're related to combinations of those features. And that makes for a challenging analytics problem. So traditionally, you have two options for approaching this problem. You have macro kinds of analyses. That's like if you're looking at an Excel pivot table and you're breaking down your denials by payer or by facility or benial ty denial type. This has its place but it doesn't get you specific enough answers to be actionable. Right? It tells you, here are the top five facilities in my network that has a, have a denials problem. Well, what problem do they have? How do you fix it? Why? It tells you pre-cert imaging denials are a major problem in my network. Well, again, why? How do I fix that? It gets you the basic information you need about denials, but it doesn't get you down to specific enough descriptions to be actionable. That's the macro level side. Your other alternative is that you can take a narrow micro approach. 
you can have a person review individual claims and look for patterns. Now people are good at spotting patterns, so they are going to find some. They're going to find patterns like these 10 claims were miscoded in the same way, or people at this facility don't seem to be following our pre-certification procedures, or the doctors over there don't seem to be following our physician documentation procedures. Those are nice patterns, but they're anecdotal and they're local. Were they caused by somebody having a bad day? Are they going to happen again next month? You get these kind of specific answers, but you don't know if they will generalize. So the macro level analysis and the micro level analysis each have their place, but ultimately they're both very limited. The kind of answer you actually want, the kind of denials pattern you actually want, is somewhere in the middle. And that's where most of the opportunity for addressing denials is. Here's what an answer from the middle sounds like. It sounds like we have a problem with pre-certification denials on outpatient MRIs with contrast when a diagnosis of sciatica is billed with one of these two HCPCS codes on the claim. The facility is not fully integrated into our network of providers. The payer is private and the employee responsible for obtaining the pre-cert has been with us for less than six months. That's the kind of specific, rich description of a denials pattern that you can actually act on. You can act on it with a new, nuanced and specific intervention. It's an answer that embraces the complexity of your claims data. And it's definitely not low-hanging fruit. So why can't you get to these rich descriptions of mid-level patterns with traditional analytics? Well, traditional analytics they all start with people asking questions. So, for example, in the pivot table approach that I mentioned before, you say, let's break down my, my denials. Let's break them down by denial type, by department, and by payer. Okay, write some code for that query, hit it against the database, see what you get at. Okay, let's try denial type and DRG and account class. Break it down like that. Write some more code, hit that against the data, see what you get at. But maybe those aren't the right thing, three things. Maybe you have to try more. You have to ask more questions, write more code, uh, and this iterative process can go on and on and on. Let's think about what you would need to ask in order to get to the kind of answer I gave a minute ago. So to get to that answer, you need to break down your denials by denial type, pre-certification, by procedure, MRI with contrast, by account class, outpatient, by the procedure codes on the claims, by the facility type, non-integrated, by the payer type, private, and by the longevity of a particular staff member. That's a seven-factor analysis. So if you code, imagine what that SQL query looks like. And if you don't code, imagine how you would get there through a string of pivot table manipulations in Excel. You could do it, but it's going to take a while. And now suppose those are the wrong seven factors. Why not some other seven factors? Maybe you need to be looking at patient status and the referring provider's department and the existence of an ECI code on the claim and the patient's age. That's a different query. You can write that one too, but how long can you spend writing queries and how long can you spend pivoting? So that's the fundamental problem. And in fact, it's a fundamental mathematical problem, which is combinatorial complexity. If you're capturing 100 features of every claim, and actually that's an underestimate, right? How many seven-factor analyses can you do? The number of seven-factor analyses on a data set with 100 features is 16 billion. That's 16 billion queries you can write uh, to get to all of those seven-factor patterns. And what if you needed a 10-factor combination to really characterize your denials pattern? That's the wall. So just to put a visual with those numbers, suppose this is your data set, has 100 features on each claim. Now the number of possible queries you could write, the number of possible insights you could get, is this. And now you know your data set is not actually staying static, it's growing every year because you're seeing more patients and you're capturing more information about each patient that you see. So what's the number of possible queries and number of possible insights after your data grows for another year? That's what complexity looks like. So the two types of growth the fact that you're capturing more about each data point and your data is growing and this combinatorial complexity, these types of growth compound and they produce a level of complexity that traditional tools 
Anything that's reliant on your smart people asking smart questions just doesn't handle effectively. Even a great denials management team with great tools is not going to be able to overcome this fundamental combinatorial complexity problem to produce the kind of rich, actionable patterns that I described before. And that's why this denials problem has remained so persistent. The solution requires an actual different way of thinking. You can't start with people asking questions. You have to start with the data. You start with the data. You let software do what it's good at and look through the possible patterns and surface only the ones that are relevant. Surface the relevant patterns, show those to a decision maker, and then you let people do what they're good at, which is interpreting data. So this hybrid approach where software does, software does what it's good at and people do what they do best, that's how you work your way out of this combinatorial complexity problem. Out of the gigantic number of possible patterns, you only surface the strongest ones and you present those to the people who are working on denials management. This lets your revenue cycle leaders start 50 or 75% of the way through their workflows and they get to the richer patterns faster. They don't have to do the easy part anymore. They can start with the part beyond the pivot tables where they're actually seeing the results. It also lets your people working appeals work queues uh, work faster. Their claims, now their claims start to arrive in batches with a description of each of those claims and an expectation about what the problem is, a rich description of what the problem is expected to be with each claim. They process their claims more effectively. And all told, this hybrid approach means that you get to denials patterns and you start acting on those denials patterns much, much faster than with traditional methods. So how do we get there? Well, remember, we're looking for mid-level patterns of denials and richly described profiles of each of those patterns. So here's how we do that. So first, we apply any number of algorithms to a data set. These algorithms might come out of statistics, out of geometry, out of machine learning. Um, we try a variety of options because every data set responds differently to different ones. We use those different algorithms along with all of the features in your data to construct a multifaceted notion of similarity. That is, for any pair of claims, we want to understand how similar are these two claims? How similar are they in the context of this data set based on everything we know about these claims? With that multifaceted notion of similarity, we're going to cluster different data points together into small groups of data that are very, is very similar to each other. And then we create something called a similarity map. The similarity map shows you where the similar data points are, and this is what's going to reveal those mid-level patterns. So here's what a similarity map looks like. A similarity map has nodes and edges. The nodes are the small dots, like here and here, and the edges are the lines between them. A node in one of these maps is a group of similar claims, similar based on that multifaceted notion of similarity I mentioned before. But this group of claims might have overlap with this group of claims. Maybe there are 100 claims here that are all similar to each other, another 200 claims here that are all similar to each other, but there's an overlap of 50 claims. We represent that overlap with an edge. So what this means is that similar claims end up relatively close together in this network and very different claims tend to end up far apart. So that when you see a region in this network like this one, or like this one, a geometrically coherent region, that's a group of claims that's all similar to each other and relatively distinct from the rest of the network. Now remember that the notion of similarity is complex here and multifaceted. So similar claims tend to be close by and different claims tend to be far apart, but similar means several different things simultaneously. So in this map, you might see a preponderance of Medicare claims over here, while the Blue Cross claims are mainly over here. And you might see mostly MRI claims over here, and the CT claims, well, those are similar, but they're not the same, so they're over here. You might see claims for a certain diagnosis in one part of the network and other diagnoses elsewhere. All of these different factors go into what's called similar, and that goes into the position of the different claims in this map. 
So this similarity map is actually what allows you to surface those mid-level patterns. What we do is we color the similarity map to show off the variable of interest, which is the concentration of denied claims. So in this picture, red nodes are ones where there are many more denied claims than you would expect based on the percentage of denied claims overall in the data set. So this region has a particular preponderance of denied claims. This region has more denied claims than you would expect based on the background rate. These blue regions, things are going relatively well here. There aren't so many denials. These colors are what surface those groups of similar claims that have high concentration of denials. So for example, let's look at this group, right? This is a group that's geometrically distinct. That means it's a bunch of claims that are all similar to each other and relatively different from the rest of the claims in the data set. And it's also bright red, which means that in this group of claims, there are many more denials than there should be based on the background rate in the data set. So we can immediately discover these mid-level patterns of claims that have high concentration of denials. Now, how do we get to that <clears throat> uh, rich description of what the denials pattern is? Well, we look at each of these groups independently. And since we constructed this map using that multifaceted notion of similarity, we ask ourselves, well, what is it that's causing these groups, these claims to be called similar? And there is going to be a, several, a combination of factors that answers that question. Right? The claims in this group, why did they get put together and called similar? It's going to be several of these features that contributed to that designation of similarity, and those several features are going to be what give us that rich description. I'll go into this with a specific example in a little while. So these similarity maps allow us to identify the patterns in the middle, the mid-level patterns, and, and they allow us to get to these rich descriptions. That's the secret to getting beyond the low-hanging fruit, beyond the combinatorial complexity problem, and really starting to get some traction on denials. So once we've identified those mid-level patterns and the rich descriptions, what happens next? Well, first we go group by group to identify drivers of rejections and denials. You know that the drivers of rejection and denial differ from payer to payer or from procedure to procedure. You know that some MRI denials have one kind of driver and others have a different one. Well, the more specifically you narrow down the groups of denials that you look at, the more precise you're able to get about what's driving rejections and denials. So we look at each of those mid-level patterns independently and understand the drivers of rejections in each one. One thing that this allows us to do is to prioritize and streamline work queues for claims resubmission. It streamlines because it gives the person working the work queue all of the claims from one of these groups in a single batch. So you can say to that person, here's a pattern of denials, Here's a description of what's driving those denials. And here are all of the claims that fall into that pattern. That person can process them in a batch, process them quickly and effectively, and streamline their work. The other thing that this allows us to do is inform upstream process changes to prevent future denials. So we may discover that a particular group of denials uh, needs a change to physician education or requires a change in coding practices. Because we have this very specific description of what's driving the denials, we can make that process change targeted and nuanced. Again, we'll get to an example of this in a little while. So as a case study, uh, we worked with a particular provider who had actually put quite a bit of work into the denials problem. And despite years of effort, they continued to write off tens of millions of dollars annually. And this provider was actually doing quite well. They had a good database set up, they had a very good reporting team, and they had implemented the best practices for revenue cycle management. They had several existing initiatives around reducing denials. And in fact, compared to the industry benchmark, they were doing pretty well. But still, they were writing off tens of millions of dollars a year, and pretty good wasn't good enough. They wanted to get to zero we were able to do a couple of things with them. So first, we were able to identify new patterns of denied claims that they hadn't seen before. 
Second, we were able to take patterns that they already knew about, but make them more specific and more actionable. One thing that our approach was able to do that the previous approach uh, could not do was to specifically compare rejected claims against similar claims that were not rejected so that we could get to specifically what the drivers were for those rejected claims. And by identifying those new more specific patterns of denials and drivers for denials, we were able to suggest new options for interventions and more precise targeted interventions than they were doing before. The solution is projected to address 70% of the denial dollars that this provider sees, and it will continue to identify new denials patterns as they arise going forward. So what I'd like to do now is to talk you through the process I just described live with a particular example. In this example, we're going to be using data that follows the format of the UB04 form. So for each form locator on this form, you get one data field. Um, this includes everything like procedure codes, six fix codes, diagnosis codes, uh, providers, whether or not a pre-cert was obtained, condition codes, occurrence codes, everything that appears on a UB04. We also had additional data that went with each account that coming from the provider's financial databases, and we had the associated 835 remit transactions, so we could see what happened to each claim, whether it was rejected or denied or appealed or how it was processed. We restricted our work to primary payer data and to personal or family guarantors. So with the, that data, we went through this workflow which is essentially what I described before, but here it is all in one place. So we take that claims data, ingest it into a staging database where we do a variety of transformations, and put it into the software that generates the similarity maps. So we generate those similarity maps, just like you saw before, and color them by the percentage of denials. That surfaces those mid-level patterns, or hotspots, as you'll see in a couple of minutes, and then we investigate each one of those hotspots for the drivers of rejection and denial and one of those rich descriptions. We produce that rich description in the form of a, of a report that you can view in Excel. And that report then goes to a denials management leader who identifies the driver, who looks at that report to understand drivers of projections and to decide what sort of process modifications uh, could be used coming out of that particular hotspot. So remember, the way that this works is that we're constructing a multifaceted notion of similarity. We're using that to cluster similar data points, and then we're creating these similar, similarity maps. In these maps, nodes are groups of similar data points. Edges connect similar nodes. We use colors to see where the denials are. And also, the position of a node on the screen doesn't matter, as you'll see. So let me show you what this looks like. Here's a similarity map like I discussed before. As you see, it's made up of nodes and edges. Here's a node, right? So this is a group of claims that are all similar to each other. And here's another one, another group of similar claims. And these two groups have some overlap, so they're connected by an edge. The position of the nodes on the screen doesn't matter. In fact, we can do this and see that the network, the similarity map is springy. It doesn't matter where we put things. It just matters which, things, which nodes are close to which other nodes and which ones are far apart. Because as I said before, in this map, similar claims end up close to each other and different claims tend to end up further apart. And then we use colors to see what's going on with this map. So we can color by where the denials are as we did before, but we might also use other colors to just investigate what's going on here. So for example, we could color by a particular payer. Now red are the areas where there's a specific concentration of Medicare claims, and blue where there are not so many Medicare claims. Here's where there are concentrations of claims to a specific private provider, payer rather, and areas where that private payer is not so well represented. Sometimes claims end up close to each other in this map because of a particular diagnosis. There's only a small pocket of bright red here with this color scheme. This is a color scheme for sciatica claims. Well, there aren't so many of those in this data set. They're all right here together, pretty much. 
On the other hand, we can see some diagnoses that are spread all over the similarity map. This is the diagnosis code for hypertension. And you see that the colors are relatively even across the whole map, which means there's a fair amount of hypertension evenly spread throughout this data, data set. We could look at all sorts of other things this way. We could look at the length of stay. Now red shows the areas where there's a relatively long length of stay, and blue shows the areas where it's relatively short. We could look at the total charges invoiced on each claim. Now red shows the regions of claims where the total charges are fairly high, and blue where the total charges are fairly low. So all of these different color schemes start to show you how the similarity map is working. It's using all of these different features and more to decide which claims should be called similar to each other and which claims are different. Then it's putting the similar claims relatively close together and the different claims relatively far apart. All right, but what we really care about here is getting to the patterns of denial. So let's color again by the patterns of rejection. This, is, uh, this color scheme is by rejections for medical necessity. So the red areas of this map now are regions where there's a disproportionate amount of medical necessity rejections, many more than the background rate. And so that means that when you look at a region like this one, or a region like this one, that's geometrically distinctive and bright red, means it's a group of claims that's all similar to each other that also has many more denials than you would expect. Those are our hotspots or our mid-level patterns that we want to understand. So when we find a region like that, we can select it and make a group out of it. So let's just call that group hotspot. And we add it there. Now, in fact, there are many hotspots. There are plenty of other hotspots in this map. So there's the one I just created up here, but here's another, here's another, here's another, another. All of these are nice mid-level patterns of denials that we could go investigate separately and understand their drivers. Let's go back to this one that I just made. So now, this is the pattern that we were looking for, one of the patterns that we were looking for, and we just need to understand what's making these claims similar and what's driving rejections and denials within this group. There are tools for doing that within the software, but for a more familiar look on it, we can switch over to this report that you can see in Excel. So here's what this report does. It takes the group that we just found, that little island in the similarity map. It gives you some basic information about that group. It tells you how many claims are in that group, how many of them are rejected, and what dollar figures that corresponds to. Also breaks down some of the basic features of that group. So which payers are represented, which providers are represented, what bill types. Then for the codes, the revenue codes, the procedure codes, and the diagnosis codes, it tells you which codes are appearing unusually commonly in this group and which ones are unusually rare. So the codes in black are unusually common and the ones in red are unusually rare in this group. So as you start to look through these different parts of the report, you get a sense of what ended up in this little island of claims. And in this case, the best hints come out of the Hicks-Picks codes. This is a group of colonoscopies. If you look down at the diagnoses, they fit with that understanding. And if you look back up at the revenue codes, you see that this gastrointestinal services revenue code appears on almost all of the claims in this group. So this is a group of colonoscopies. There's primarily one provider, but with a couple of others represented in this group. And there's primarily one payer. So now we understand a little bit about what this group is. We can ask for what's driving rejections within this group. And for that, we come over to this other pane of the Excel report. And here we have information about only the rejections in this hotspot. When we look at only the rejections, we start to see some other patterns emerge. So first, we see that there's one particular provider, 
who's accounting for almost all of the rejections in this group. We also see that there's one clinic that's accounting for about 50%, with a couple of other facilities following well behind that. And then as we look at the codes, again, black is codes that are unusually common, and red means codes that are unusually rare. So in this pane of the report, black means codes that are appearing a lot on rejections, and red means codes that are not appearing so much on rejections. So then you start to see pairs like these two anesthesia codes. The general anesthesia code is appearing a lot on rejections, and the specific one is appearing much more rarely. That's giving you a suggestion about what you might change in your coding practices. And as you look through the other codes in this report, you come up with other suggestions and other ideas about how you might act to resolve this particular group of denials. So just to recap, what we're able to do with this analysis is identify drivers of rejections and denials in particular groups of claims. Those drivers of rejections and denials are very specific to those groups, not to what's driving rejections and denials overall in the net provider network, but only for specific types of claims. Out of that, we're able to come up with specific suggestions uh, for work cues for claims resubmission. So in the colonoscopy case that we just looked, for, looked at, um, there are specific changes that you could make to coding procedures that would help to resolve this group of denials. And we also are able to inform upstream process changes to prevent future denials. So again, because we have this specific description of the colonoscopy claims and why they're being denied, uh, we're able to focus on process changes preventing uh, exactly that set of denials. So instead, for example, instead of having to re-educate re all of the GI physicians in the practice, we only target the particular clinic that's driving this problem. And we don't have to address every colonoscopy claim that they encounter, but only the claims of the type that are appearing in this hotspot. To say a little bit more about that colonoscopy example, as it turns out, this is hitting on a, a set of payer rules that's relatively familiar to providers, um, a, rule, a set of rules around screening colonoscopies. And screening colonoscopies are, are known to be a relatively difficult kind of procedure to code. Uh, the coding rules depend very specifically on which payer you're encountering, on whether the colonoscopy is purely screening or whether it becomes diagnostic or therapeutic, and on the specific ordering of codes that you use on the claim form. So when we're able to look at we're we're able to look at that group of colonoscopies and say this is not all of the colonoscopies that are being done by this provider this is a spe specific group that's being denied for a specific reason based on a specific set of rules. This is what we mean by understanding payer behaviors. There might be many rules around coding colonoscopy claims. It depends on the payer and on the context and on the exact codes used. And an expert might gradually learn those rules over time but they also might change. And the ones that are relevant at any given time might change. And so what we're able to do is surface exactly the rules that were causing trouble for this provider at this moment in time. If there's a different set of screening colonoscopy rules that are causing trouble next month, we'll identify that set of rules instead. That's what we mean by an adaptive system that understands payer behavior. Finally, I'd just like to touch on something that I know is top of everyone's mind at the moment, uh, the ICD-10 transition. So you probably already know that CMS estimates that the ICD-10 transition could double denials rates or even worse. Um, in terms of denials analytics, this transition is going to take a hard problem and make it even more complex. It's going to make traditional methods hit the wall even sooner. So the first thing ICD-10 is going to do is it's going to increase the number of codes substantially. Effectively, that increases the amount of data, the granularity of data that you're capturing about each claim. And that means the combinatorial complexity in this problem is going to explode. So there has always been a long tail with uh, ICD-9 codes, meaning that there are a few codes that are used frequently, 
and there are a lot more codes that are used very rarely. With the explosion of codes in ICD-10, the long tail gets even longer. There are, again, a few codes that are used frequently, but there are even more codes that are used rarely. And that kind of data is especially hard for most traditional methods. It doesn't do well with the question-driven uh, macro kinds of analyses. It's something that you really need the data-first approach to, do, to use. Second thing that the ICD-10 transition is going to do is it's going to change up behavior from payers and from providers. And it's going to wipe out the intuition that people have developed about how ICD-9 coding system works. So you won't be able to rely on the same old heuristics. You need a solution that can infer new rules as they arise, and that can be automated and adapt as new patterns emerge. And finally, the ICD-10 transition is going to make obsolete any kind of methods or heuristics that rely on a specific understanding of the ICD-9 hierarchy or heuristics about existing code sets. You need a code agnostic method that doesn't care particularly about the ICD-9 hierarchy, but, but uses the general, uh, a general analytics approach to understand the codes um, as features of claims. So to conclude, denials management is a challenging problem. It's a complex problem with a complex set of data, and the low-hanging fruit is pretty much taken care of. What providers need now is a way to identify the mid-level patterns and to come up with rich descriptions of those mid-level patterns that you can actually act on. For that, you need a data-first approach. You need to use software to understand the relevant patterns of denials and present only those to the human decision makers. If you're interested in learning more about this presentation or about IASD's work, you're welcome to connect with me to download the docs in our handout section or to go to our website at iasd.com healthcare or email info at iasd.com. Thanks very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gilmore, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Dr. Gilmore will attempt to answer as many questions as she can during the time we have for our Q&A, and will follow up on questions she does not have the opportunity to address. Okay, Dr. Gilmore, um, the first question for our audience is, how long does it take to discover these groups, or hotspots, hot as you call them? So once the data is in the system, uh, making these similarity maps and doing the colors to, to surface the patterns is very quick. I mean, you can, you can go from a data set to, to the Excel reports in less than a week. So this is something that you can, this also means this is something that you can redo as frequently as you need to to identify the latest patterns. Okay, thank you. Um, we now have another question from our audience. Um, an audience, audience member would like to know, what are the elements of the data set? And is this a constant set or variable? So the elements in the data set that we used, I mean, it, there's, there's quite a bit of flexibility, and whatever data you have is, is data that could be useful to, to do this kind of analysis. The data that we used in the example I talked about today was essentially a copy of the UB04 form. So it had all of the same information that a typical UB04 form would have, so diagnosis codes and procedure codes and um, the payer and the facility and the department and the attending provider the charges, anything and everything. But if there's more that you have available to pull in about each claim, then, then you pull in more. Um, and whether it's constant or variable, I think you mean how something like how frequently can it be updated? Um, so we can do a sort of historical retrospective analysis that look, you know, so for the provider I, I mentioned in the case study, we did a retrospective analysis on two years worth of data and we're able to uh, you know, explain the, the long-standing patterns that they saw, but we are also able to look at just the most, you know, just last quarter's data or some, uh, you know, a rolling window over three months at a time and, and see the latest patterns that way. 
Sure, that makes sense. Okay, so the next question from our audience is, what is the difference between a rejection and a denial? Oh, yes. So different people use these terms differently. What I mean, uh, when I say rejection, I just mean a claim that has been rejected by a payer at some point, um, even if that's appealed and later paid. And when I say denial, I actually mean write-off. Um, so I know that the terminology differs from place to place, but that's what I mean by it. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, how much work goes into the data prep for using the tool? So we have a standard data schema that matches up against provider EMRs and financial systems for the most part, and uh, the data has to match against that schema, and then we have a standard set of data prep um, procedures that, that we use before putting it into the software. Okay, so, thank you. Um, our next question is, has this methodology really reduced scalability? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure I understand that question, to be honest. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I see that there's a longer version. Oh, we'll wait for some clarification. In the meantime, you can answer another question from our audience. Um, we have a denials management solution. Does your solution replace ours? So most denials management solutions that I'm familiar with, uh, they implement the sort of macro analysis that I described at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, that kind of analysis is still useful for what it is, for sort of high-level tracking of denials. And our solution would not replace that, it would complement it. I can okay, go back perfect. to the question about scalability before. Um, please do. So, right, so the full question is, has this methodology in your practice really reduced the scalability issue? The number of features in a claims set when compared to the possible similarity scores also scales exponentially. How many trials of similarity functions paired with claims features did it take for you to find a strong spread? So the answer in practice is that when we first approached this problem, we had to try a number of different similarity measures. Um, now, the format of the data goes a long way towards dictating which measures of similarity actually make sense. Um, so we didn't have to try that many. But we tried enough to get to what we consider our best practices, and that leaves us down to uh, you know, two or three that we tend to use because they tend to work well with what we've seen. And so, um, yeah, I think that we really have reduced the scalability issues. We also have other kind of machine learning methods that I, I didn't mention in the talk to, to uh, do some dimensionality reduction on the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, for our next question, do you have to transfer the data from the EMR or will this talk with the system? Uh, so we have some amount of data automation. Uh, we, we ask for the data to be presented in a particular schema, and then we have a standard set of transforms that we use uh, to manipulate it before it goes into our system. Perfect. Thank you. Um, for our next question, what machine learning algorithms are used? Uh, which machine learning algorithm? Uh, so I haven't yet seen a machine algorithm that doesn't pair with this approach. Um, in practice, again, when we first went through this workflow, we tried a number of different options. Once we had tried a couple, we've now seen that there are a couple that tend to work well with claims data. Um, but yeah, the, the answer is sort of that if you have a favorite, we can probably incorporate it. OK, thank you. Um, another audience member would like to know, how have clients in the past operationalized these insights? Are they built into a work tool or a part of your solution? I'm just reading the question. Give me one minute here. Uh, so what we would do is to produce the rules that could be built into a work queue, uh, and then clients can, can operationalize those rules in their Epic installs. Um, every Epic install is a little bit different, um, and of course there are other EMR programs as well. And so uh, what we do is output a set of rules. That's a straightforward thing for someone to implement in, in one of those systems for a work queue. 
Okay, thank you. We have quite a few questions coming in. Our next question, um, you discussed the denial patterns and said something about the understanding of the coding rules for a given time. How do you categorize the rules you uncover? And how do you specifically address them? Are they the same rules from Clo Coding Clinic AHA or the formal uniform guidelines from the government? So we haven't hard-coded the rules uh, into our system. That is, we don't, we're not identifying rules in the sense of saying, you know, rule number 430 is the one being violated in this situation. Um, what we're doing is sort of uncovering the, the in-practice rules. So the ones that are actually used frequently enough that they're impacting the, the given provider that we're working with. Um, and so what I mean by a rule is we might say, look, it looks like in this particular group of claims, when you code it in this way, it tends to get rejected. And when you use these codes instead, uh, it tends to not get rejected. And now in the colonoscopy example, you go back and you compare against the coding guidelines for colonoscopy. And in that example, there was a particular payer, right? So you look at that specific payer and their coding guidelines. And it turns out that the rules we've identified are exactly the rules that that payer has. Right, so it's no, it's no surprise that claims need to be coded in the way that we're recommending. Um, it's just that when there are so many rules and so many possible ways of applying them, you don't really know which ones are actually relevant in your particular situation. And so we're surfacing the ones that are actually relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, do you have standard interfaces of data already established for any HIM? Uh, we have a standard data schema that we ask for the data to be presented in, and all of the data fields that we're asking for are, they appear on a standard UB04 claim form, so they are uh, pieces of information that, that every provider has. Perfect. Um, for our next question, does the technology get better at identifying trends over time without any human intervention? So yes, the technology definitely gets better at identifying trends over time. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an adaptive system that's um, identifying new patterns as you put in new data. OK, perfect. And um, on to our next question. An audience member would like to know if most of the data is compiled from the 837 and 835 files. So yes, effectively it's, it's coming from the 837 and 835. Um, whether that, exactly how that data is stored in your backend system may vary from provider to provider. And some providers may have additional data elements that they want to input. So for example, in the answer that I gave about, or, you know, the example answer that I gave about the longevity of a particular employee tasked with obtaining pre-certifications, um, you know, you'd have to access an an employee uh, like HR system to, to bring in that kind of information. But the, the short answer is most of the data is coming off 837 and 835. The more that you have to feed into the system, the better. OK, thank you, Dr. Gilmore. Um, we have another audience member who works on the medical necessity denials. And a lot of them, they say, are um, for lack of medical necessity codes for use of new LASTA and um, they get a lot of pushback from the physician. They would like to know how can they educate the physicians when they fight them just when they query the denial. So this is definitely a challenge um, and when the providers that I've worked with have, have seen this as well. So I think there are two things here that, that help with that challenge. The first is that from what I've seen, physicians are receptive to data if you, and they're also competitive. So if you tell them, uh, you know, the data says that this is where the problem is, and it says that your practice is having more trouble than your colleagues' practice, uh, they are incentivized to start fixing that. The other piece of the answer is that these sort of very specific descriptions of denials problems that I'm talking about, they mean, they mean that you don't have to re-educate all physicians about everything. Right? So you don't have to go back to physicians and try to educate them on things that they already know. You can go to them and you can say, look, I know that you understand how to do colonoscopies and how to code them correctly. It's just that there's this particular problem in this specific instance that's leading to a lot of denials. And that kind of education effort uh, should be better received. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, our next question from the audience, do you aggregate data across multiple clients for a wider view of issues impacting many providers? Uh, so no, we don't aggregate data across different clients. Um, and in fact, we're, we're very careful about uh, data security and, and HIPAA compliance and, and all of that sort of thing. So that would prevent us from combining data in that way. Perfect, thank you. Um, and the next question from our audience is that this seems fairly complicated. Uh, what would you recommend um, in terms of skill sets that are required for this? So we, uh, we recommend a, a model where there are two roles. So one role has a person working in the software, a person or, or, or maybe two working in the software to uncover these hotspots. So that person will be presented with a set of similarity maps. That's our, our recommendation. They'll have the ability to make additional maps. Um, and they will be asked to find the hotspots in those maps and, and do an initial look at uh, what are the features of those hotspots. That person then generates those Excel reports that I showed. And that goes to the person in the second role. So the second role uh, is a revenue cycle leadership kind of role. And that person looks at these Excel reports and is, no, and is looking at what are the patterns that I'm being presented with and how would I act on them? So that person is doing the data interpretation um, and, and uh, driving the action on each of the patterns that, that we're finding. Oh, I didn't get to So the, the person who's working in the software, the skill set there, it's really the same sort of skill set that you need to be, say, a, a database admin. I mean, this is a different kind of technology, so we have a training and enablement program around that, but the the fundamental skills there are not so different from what you need to be a, a database or reporting person. And then the person who's looking at the Excel reports, this is really a, a revenue cycle person, someone who understands uh, denials and understands revenue cycle management. And you need to have some understanding of analytics you know, at the level of Excel, say, but they certainly don't have to have any uh, deep knowledge of advanced analytics. Sure, thank you very much. Um, all right, at this time, we have time for a few more questions from our audience. Just as a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into the control panel in the space that's labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Oh, to wrap up, we have one last question. How automated is this? Uh, okay, so much of the system is automated. We have an automated way of transforming the data and presenting um, similarity maps that we expect to be the best maps uh, to work from. But then there is a role for a person in the software to refine those maps and, um, and you know, help the system adapt uh, to new data coming in. And then the more important, and then the production of those Excel reports is automated. Uh, and then, of course, there's, there's always going to be a manual step at the end where a person looks at the results and really tries to interpret and understand them. Um, so, you know, the, the software can surface the most important patterns. It can describe those patterns to you in very specific ways based on the data it's seen. But ultimately, a person at the end still has to look at that pattern and understand it in a deep way and come up with what to do about it. So it's a hybrid system. Perfect, thank you. Um, we actually have time for one more question. Um, an audience member would like to know, do you think denials and other checking systems would be more diminished if we hire more educated and trained staff? Given that a high school diploma can let a person code and get a CSS or CCS certificate. So I actually don't think so. Um, from what I've seen, you know, Everybody in the system is working hard and they're trying to do the right thing. And the situation is that the rules are very complicated and they change all the time. And so this is just, this is a hard problem. It's a, it's a complex healthcare system that we have. And I think that um, it's a problem that's best solved by having people and software work together. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Gilmore, um, and thank you for your excellent presentation and for all of our participants today. We look forward to having you join us again for future webinars.
This conclu concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon.